You guys just have to get used to the sound of the rain outside because I don't have it any other time to record this. Fandom has been around for ages, the earliest mention of it dating back to 1903. Being a subculture, it works in the framework of an overculture, society at large. And what that really means, apart from all the fancy smancy words that academia has taught me, is that fandom, like any other facet of society, works under the rules and framing of the culture it's surrounded in. The standard has always been good for light-skinned, skinny, cishet, able-bodied, and neurotypical men in particular. A fact that is built into every facet of society. And that's just a reality that a fat, queer, disabled, and dark-skinned person of color would have to live through every single day until we won't have to. And despite the nebulous way that the internet has worked to erase a lot of global boundaries, even more so in the pandemic, it's only fair to say that we've all realized that those prejudices are everywhere, fandom included, and continue to be perpetuated by everyone at large. I know what you're thinking. SJ, we already know this. Stop talking out your ass and get to the point. Well, it's called setup, and honestly, imaginary audience, you should learn a bit of patience because I have a point. Firstly, to go back to my roots, I'm going to talk about Penumbra just to demonstrate it. In late October of 2020, my good friend Jeanette and I started a Vespid-centric AU for Penumbra. Now, I'm not telling you this to brag about it or something cringe like that, no. I'm telling you this because it was the first time I encountered the thought. You see, the Juno Steel storyline focuses on a lot of queer themes and relationships, one of the main ones being a relationship between two disabled women in their early or late 50s. And what I discovered on the day I listened to the Juno Steel episode that featured one of those women was that there wasn't a lot of content in the fandom for them, despite them taking up more than enough of the storyline in the latest season. And that leads me to my second point. Why not? Like, think about it. You come from fandoms like, I don't know, Percy Jackson or some other shonen anime, and you're like, Okay, I, I get sapphic fix or sapphic relationships not being popular in this fandom. There aren't really a lot of female relationships or complex enough female characters to get invested in. Most of the time, if you encounter fans of sapphic ships and fandoms like that, they're going to be a rare pair or play second fiddle to any canon or non-canon but still popular ships in the fandom. But then you get to fandoms like the Juno Steel one, and you start thinking. There's no lack of female and or feminine characters in this story, especially not complex ones. Juno Steel is trans femme, and he's the main protagonist of the story. You have Buddy, whose two-part episode remains to be the best of season 3, I'm still not taking criticism from that one. You have Vespa, who is one of the most underrated and underexplored characters in the fandom. <laughs> you have Rita, who is the main character's best friend, Sasha Wire, Sarah Steele. You can throw a dart at any season of Penumbra, and I can give you a complex female and or feminine character I can give you a fic pitch of. One of the main ships of this storyline is Sapphic. Buddy and Vespa reunite, propose to each other, and get married on screen. On audio? And their reunion and wedding are two of the most beautiful scenes in canon. For all the hand-waving that goes for their pasts, you can most definitely start your own theories and explore what kind of pasts they may have had, what their relationship could have been like before the tragedy that befell them, or just write any good old character study for them independent of each other. And you don't have to jump through the hoops of it not being canon, that's the best part. Hell, Vespa is trans, like canonically actually trans, and I feel like that should encourage more discussion, especially to fans who are also trans or going through gender identity journeys of their own. But there's not... there's not a lot of content for her. Or Buddy. Or Rita. At least not a lot of content for them separate from Juno not in any way that matters. If they're not playing second fiddle to the main ship or the main character, any nuance to their character or relationship doesn't even get any screen time. Uh, page time? To bring it back to that discussion I had with Jeanette, it wasn't actually reverse AU, <laughs> which many of you might know I am a part of. No, it was an innocuous, modern, doctor-patient AU. Simple as that. And there's nothing of the sort, N not even a coffee shop AU. Penumbra's second made ship was made canon in March of 2018 and became an official fixture in the larger canon, I guess you could say March of 2020. And there's virtually nothing outside the collective efforts of a majority of sapphic fans in the fandom. <laughs> it was... it was infuriating, 
to realize that. I'd have understood maybe if they were as small or insignificant as Valus, Vicky, and Ingrid Lake were. Jokingly, I've called them the proto-lesbians of Juniverse canon because the inclusion of their story in Midnight Fox and Buddy and Vespa's inclusion in Time Gone By served the same function as a vehicle for Juno to compare his relationship to Norea with. And I'll get to that a bit later in the video. When I realized this, it really confused me. I asked Jeanette, Why? And Jeanette said, It's because people hate women. And, well, they kind of were right, weren't they? Okay, backing up, I'm gonna have to give a couple disclaimers here. I am not accusing anyone of anything, but hey, if I throw something at you that you can't dodge, maybe try to think about why. Though I may have been raised female, I'm still very much non-binary and experience femininity, misogyny, and womanhood in a very different way. I'm attracted to women, but the gender bit kind of muddies that. It's complicated. So though this is going to be talking a lot about sapphic ships and fandom and how people hate them, I'm going to have to be general and stay in my lane. I've been in fandom since 2011, but the internet is a wild thing and a lot of fandoms and social media is incredibly American and European centric. I am Filipino. I will have missed a lot of sapphic-centric content or fandoms growing up both Catholic and without access to a lot of it. I might not know about any fiascos from your fandoms, so to make my job easier on me, I'll, I'll just stick to any fandoms I've been in before. And that means I will be spoiling the following media I am currently flashing on screen. It's not gonna be a lot of spoilers anyway, so. And at that, the Penumbra is one of the only things I've been into that gives me access to a sapphic ship that is canon, so if you think this doesn't apply to your fandom, then one, that sucks, sorry to hear it, get better soon, might I suggest a Penumbra podcast. Um, secondly, if the shoe doesn't fit, I can't do anything about that, but hope you find solace in your rare pairs. Alright, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pretend to make a case for all the fandom misogynists. Just roleplay the devil's advocate. Because I don't know, for some, for some reason a lot of people don't know how to process the existence of their own prejudices. <sighs> okay, let's go. 1. Can't relate. This one's the most prevalent of them all, I think, so let's just get it out of the way. There's a trend in widespread media where a majority of BL and MLM content has been written by and for women. This is prevalent in a lot of anime and as well as Western YA. Similar to the way male writers adopt female characters to be able to properly emote, female writers have decided to adopt male characters to be able to explore tropes, emotions, and actions that are usually frowned upon when seen on women. You can think of it as an odd response to the existence of the rules of gender binary. <laughs> As someone who was female socialized growing up, I know the struggle. There were restrictions at every side that told me I could do something because I was a girl. And writing through the lens of that gender binary, it was easier to think that writing male characters who are allowed to feel anger, frustration, aggression, and be able to and were even expected to express these emotions, well, it was an easy out. Writing female characters at the time took a lot of examination, but generally as I grew older, it became very clear to me that it wasn't actually that hard. If you know how people behave and let them behave like so, then writing them generally becomes a lot easier regardless of gender. How is this at all related to why people hate women? Well, that's just it. Writers who are assigned female at birth experience a lot of social dysphoria and end up using male characters as a conduit because of the restrictions cast upon them. Does that mean they find those male characters relatable? Yeah. Does that disable them from relating to female characters? Well, yes and no. There's a double standard that comes with relating to female characters in fandom spaces. Oftentimes, if you go into these spaces exploring and writing about female characters independent of the male characters that invested you in the original text, you'll notice a sudden downtick to the engagement and interactions you get from other fans. V from Tumblr made an excellent point about this in a post I recommend you read. <laughs> I'll link it in the description. In it, they cited, When I first started creating content, I made a lot for a relatively unpopular WLW ship in which both girls are canonically romantically involved with a dude. Their canonical MF ships are both very popular, and I noticed that my engagement was dropping every time I posted them. So I eventually just stopped. 
It wasn't even a conscious decision. I merely resigned myself to the fact that fandom didn't want to see sapphic ships, and some people would even go as far as to condemn them. For reference, my Instagram posts get an average of about 500 likes per post, popular ones usually exceeding 1k. But when I post this ship, my engagement drops to about 250 likes. Similarly, my Tumblr text posts have an average of about 140 notes per post, popular ones usually reaching up to 750. But my WLW content rarely surpasses 100. This just feeds the cycle of WLW never getting a rep. If, like me, content creators become disincentivized by the lack of engagement with their sapphic content, they're more likely to stop making or posting it, leading to further lack of rep. And when new content creators try to rectify that, they face the same problem. That sudden drop of engagement has happened to me once or twice before and after I joined the Penumbra fandom. Even in the big Discord service, when you're talking to people who have stayed up with you talking about some innocuous AU about Jupiter, whenever you start talking about Vespud, it's like suddenly a sudden hush falls over the room and you're left with the sapphics who relate to what you have to say. Even just in general, considering Jeanette and I run an entire AU on the concept of Vespud swapping roles with Jupiter. Hell, it's happened to other writers of Vespa, not just us. Is it because Buddy and Vespa aren't relatable? Let's see. So for Drew Peter, you have a lady who is clinically depressed, has a bit of a drinking problem, is disabled, has a bit of a hero complex, and a lot of baggage. In love with him is a guy with palpable self-identity and self-esteem issues, and a whole host of problems you definitely have if you're Asian. On the flip side of that, you have a lady who has lost in love, seems to have a drinking problem but is actually just physically disabled. She's a bit of a show stealer and a lot of she has a lot of baggage too. In love with her is a gal with palpable self-esteem issues, auditory and visual hallucinations due to a disability, and a whole host of problems you definitely have if you're trans. And yet somehow that first one is a lot more relatable. Does that add up to you? Like does that, does that make sense? <laughs> it's not that the NBLM ship has a lot more that's relatable about it, is it? Oh, well, that doesn't mean people hate women. It just means that... Well, it just means that the fans don't seem to view being physically or mentally disabled to be relatable? No, because they seem to like that from Juno, who is clinically depressed and is disabled. They often even headcanon Nerea as someone with chronic illness and or as someone on the neurodivergent spectrum. Neuro neurodivergent spectrum. <laughs> I can't read. Well, maybe it's because they don't relate to Vespa being trans. Mm, no, no. Juno's canonically non-binary trans femme and a lot of people had Kanan Nureyev as a binary trans man. Hell, there are even some fics out there that have Nureyev explore being non-binary, as well as exploring his transition as it happened as a kid. So, maybe it's the fact that they don't see Buddy and Vespa's people? Hmm. Two, not enough material to work with. There's two variants to this one. The first variant is that there aren't a lot of female characters in the story for there to be any content skewing towards sapphic ships. This is normal in shonen anime, like I said, where the cast is almost always male-centric and the female characters are cardboard cutouts with huge tits or, you know, they're just non-existent. Not even mentioning the amount of fetishization, objectification, and over-sexualization of female characters, most of whom are underage, in a lot of anime. The second variant is that female characters came in late, and there's... Well, we don't know a lot about them, or their characters. <laughs> you know, I've never known writers to see the lack of material to work with as a restriction, instead of like a, as a free pass to explore them as a character with literally nothing written about them. When I was in the Percy Jackson fandom, for example, I saw a lot of this for Nico D'Angelo. Hell, there's a lot of it for Nico D'Angelo even past the Heroes of Olympus series. Natasha from their blog Sapphic Solace rounded up fanworks from multiple book fandoms and she caught this one and summarized this phenomenon incredibly well in this blog they wrote back in 2018. Uh, link in the description. So the canon ship of Nico Will has the most. Not surprising. But here's the thing. Their relationship is barely shown. They're not canon until the trials of Apollo. 
where they're just minor characters. And before that, their relationship was a tiny bit of flirting at the end of the final Heroes of Olympus book. That's it. But that's enough for most of the fanfics on AO3. I was there when this ship was first shown to have potential, and honestly, I'd never seen so many people so excited. That was before people knew about Apollo's series, before any hope of them being canon came. Not only that, but Nico is shipped with basically every male character before any girls are shipped together. I was also there, Natasha. I was there when there were droves and droves of fakes about how Nico was in love with Percy, how he journeyed across America as a temporarily displaced emo kid who lost his sister. R.I.P. Bianca, you were fridged ahead of your time. I was there when people began shipping him with Jason Grace. Hell, I was one of them. And it's hilarious to me that people can just use the excuse of they haven't had enough screen time or we know virtually nothing about their pasts when there is a shit ton of content out there for characters who only spoke for barely 5% of the story. To put this in a penumbra context, let's talk about Nereev. This guy's a man of mystery. You know his aliases, his quirks, a flashback to the most traumatic thing that has ever happened to him. You know that he loves Juno and that Juno loves him. And nothing else. Are there fix theorizing about Nereev's past? Yeah. Are there a lot of these character studies about his past that only have something to do with a passing statement he's made? Yeah. So you have this man, who we know basically nothing about save for a few key things, that have unleashed everyone's creative juices. And then you have Buddy and Vespa, whose pasts were explored with as much brevity, if not more, than the Rev's, whose stories were told beautifully, whose reunion, proposal, and marriage was put on audio for the audience. Buddy drops tidbits about how her parents were awful, about how her father was killed by dark matters. Vespa tells you about a past of poverty and, in her vows, tells you how she and Buddy met. There's none of the same credence left to these beautifully written women that the same fans had for Nereev. So was it really lack of material or lack of interest? Three, irrelevant to the main character. Well, <laughs> here's our final point. No more detours this time. I'm punching the penumbra directly, okay? Juno Steele, private eye. He's bisexual, non-binary. He's a lady and a man, and he's in love with Peter Nereev. He was, and still is, very much the central character of the Juno Steel storyline. I mean, come on, it's got his name on it and everything. The first time he met Buddy Arinko and Vespa Ilke was in Time Gone By, released 27th March and 10th April 2018. Juno was in a hard place. He planned to walk out into the desert and die, if that's what it came down to. And around the end of the two-part episode, after many a revelation Buddy more or less forced him to have, <laughs> before Buddy and Vespa reunite, Juno says this. Sunset was really something out here. The, the domes have a blue tint, small enough that you stop seeing it after a while, but out here, unblocked and unblued, the sunset was wild. Alive, like someone set fire to the sky. And Buddy had been up here for two years, staring down that sunset, killing herself slowly in the hopes that it'd bring her the only thing she'd ever really wanted. I mean, I mean, it was a pretty thought, wasn't it? That the past could really leap back into your arms, have your love back, have your brother back. But it was just a fantasy, and soon the sun had set. We were in the dark with nothing but soft-boiled brains to show for all our dreaming. And as much as I'd love to give Kevin Vibert and Harley Takagi Kaner the benefit of the doubt, just try to justify that it, that isn't what, you know, they intended for the scene. Try to say that focusing on this part further amplifies the ideas I'm trying to stop. Well, death of the author exists. And what people take away from your script and how a majority of your fans interpret it will eventually become out of your hand. This scene and how Juno responded to Buddy and her situation makes it seem like he was seeing her as a conduit of what might have been him. I've interpreted it that way before too, that he saw Buddy's deterioration in the lighthouse as an extreme version of what could have happened between him and Narev. 
wasting away while the other was gone, holding on to the slim chance that he'd be out there and they'd reunite, risking and spending everything just to get him back, even if there's barely even the potential of a chance that he'd want the other back. The same thing happened with Ingrid Lake and Val's Vicky Midnight Fox. His questions were pointed. He made it sound like it was immoral that Vicky would still love a woman who'd done something as monstrous as killing the defenseless. It doesn't make any sense to regret it, Vic. Lake's a nut. She just tried to kill you. I don't regret turning it down just now. I don't even regret calling the cops on her all those years ago. But my conscience ain't clean, Steele. Should have treated her better. Even if I did have to ride her out. You're not making any sense. I loved her. You get that? I don't anymore, but I did. I loved her, and when the time came to turn her in, I didn't even say goodbye. She killed an innocent woman in her home. Christ, you're dense. Yes. She did. She could have killed a hundred old ladies, and that wouldn't change the fact that I loved her for years. And I owe her for every second. A goodbye? An explanation? Giving her a chance to run, or at least I could have visited her. You shouldn't have. But I coulda! Look, Steele, take it from someone who knows. Even if you're real, real lucky, you only get a few people like Ingrid over your life. Treat them like they're worth something, alright? Sure, Vic. And by the end of that episode? It doesn't make any sense to me. I spent enough of my time regretting things that I did wrong. What Vic said, regretting turning Lake in even though she'd do it all over again. That just seems like a waste of time. But even so, I keep turning it over. Examining it from all sides, like one twist might suddenly show the answer. That's more trouble than it's worth. History, I mean, relationships with other people. You regret things you knew you had to do, you do things you know you shouldn't, and why? Another warm body in your bed doesn't help anything. It doesn't stop killers or end hunger or make the world any better than it is. It just makes your bed a little warmer. That's all. That's all. Well, that's why I don't bother with all that. This is the new Juno Steel now. The P.I. who doesn't let a pretty face stop him from doing what matters. The P.I. who won't let history weigh him down. Without a pass to hold him down, a guy could take on the world. And in the morning, once I get a little sleep, that's what I'll do. So, are they? Are these sapphic ships irrelevant to Juno Steel, or do we interpret it that way? Because that's how he interacts with them. And it's funny too, how it's always the sapphic ships that get the symbolism treatment. They're still definitely their own characters, of course, but the way they act and react is almost comically puppeteered to relate to Juno's struggles and stumbles with his relationship to Nereev. Ultimately, it's not as big of a deal in text. Juno cries when Buddy and Vespa reunite, announce their proposal, and possibly even when they get married. He's supportive of their happiness and wishes them the best. It's sweet. I just wish it didn't come at the cost of the widespread interpretation of him viewing them as a caricature of his own relationship. Because when you see character and or relationship studies written for characters that aren't Juno, not even just Buddy or Vespa. Whether it be about Rita, Mick, Jet, Sasha, these fix, they will get traction and engagement on the sole basis that Juno is in it somehow. (laughs) That Juno is there to interpret it to the audience by relating himself to the character we're exploring. And as alarmingly generalized as that sounds, That's the reality of what my experience has been in the past year alone with this fandom. Not a single character study that's been independent of Juno Steele and Peter Nereev has had that much engagement. And that's just something I had to get used to. Here's one. Jeanette and I are making an AU, where Vespa and Ju Peter switch roles. Vespa is a private eye, but he is a thief. Can I make it any more obvious? (laughs) How many times am I gonna make this joke? Okay. And as much as I love the people we've brought together just by making this, a vast majority of it is just me and my friends. Not to say I expected a shit ton of them to come to us just because we made it, but the small amount of new faces leads one to believe that not a lot of people ever expected an AU like this. So devoid from the usual Juno this, Nereo that. And... Well, we're not immune to the fact that we would have to write Juno and Narev into the story. Given the way the story is structured, we would have to eventually. But Jeanette originally only wanted Vespa there to just adapt the good Jupiter episodes into Vespa somehow. And they relented eventually. 
We already have it done. We we're just taking a breather for a bit. And we joke around that we only wrote it to grab the Jupiter fans by the neck and make them listen to all the Vespid content we made. Because at this point, it feels like quitting a bit. A bit like we're succumbing to the trends of a majority of people who want new content for the same two people who've been confirmed canon since the entire series started. And I get it too. I am also a fan of Jupiter. Majority of the points I've made earlier, I have done. I've written character studies, written AUs, drawn countless fan art, made a playlist, <laughs> explored the rave's past. But that doesn't erase the amount of content I've made for Vespud and how it gets less traction than the aforementioned shit I've done. It's... V said this in their post from earlier. It, it just reminded me of the situation. In the face of all this adversity, I think a lot of WLW turned to MLM ships because they're the closest thing we have to actual rep. But when we do, we get accused of fetishizing them by the same people who fetishize us. Now, I can't speak on the fetishization bit. That stuff is much more prevalent in Western YA and BL manga slash anime, and it is part of the reality of a lot of fandoms that cis female writers have ended up fetishizing MLM ships, have woobified characters to fit a boring, palatable to the cishet mold, and when gay men speak up about it, they get silenced. Hell. I, it also kind of happens in the Penumbra fandom with Juno and Arev, but I feel like we might get off track if I start on that. <laughs> right now, I am talking about Vespa, and we are staying there. Because it honestly infuriates me that sapphic content creators have to make event after event after event just to try and buck up the amount of content made for a canon sapphic ship, but have no problem on the flip side of it. And this is where I go off the cuff for a second. Because there is literally no excuse for you to not like any sapphic ship enough to just stop a conversation short the moment they're mentioned. There is literally no excuse for you not to write at least one fic about them. Draw at least one doodle about them. Like, I know writers who have written nothing but MLM content since they got invested in one, but don't seem to want to try and change that. It's, it's disheartening. Because that reflects the world outside fandom, outside the queer community. There's a lack of diverse stories about sapphic couples out there, especially disabled trans sapphics of color. Often they're overlooked by audiences for more of the same shit. White, cis, and palatable to the people who are generally anti-queer, misogynistic, racist, and ableist. I'm not saying that's all going on in what fandoms we're in. Bit of conflating there, but fandom doesn't exist in a bubble. It's a subculture that works under the rules of an overculture. There are still racists, queerphobes, misogynists, and ableists in there. So the next time you open up a dock to write a fic for a ship you really like or make a new canvas to draw art for that ship everyone likes, think about why you invest so much time on that, but not on the sapphic ships. The next time you open up AO3, read something new. Maybe something for a sapphic ship that has less content for them. Leave a nice comment on it. <sighs> that was a lot different than my last two videos. So sorry for the dour tone that that had, but uh, it had to be said. And I did put up a poll about it, and I promised all the people I was going to make this one. This topic has been in my thoughts since before I even got the mic I am currently recording on. <laughs> to be honest, this is a load off my chest, and if I get hate for it, then so be it. Um, thank you to V for letting me use their post for this. So sorry it had to be about something you probably don't know much about, but I tried to make it as general as possible. <laughs> well, like it, hate it, send me comments, guys. If you have an entire paragraph down there debunking my points, I'll probably ignore you and move past it. <laughs> thank you to everyone who encouraged me, to Jeanette who literally dangled something over my head just to get me to finish this, and you, because you stayed far enough to get here. Stay safe. Ingat tayong lahat. Bye!